How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure How great the pain of searing loss the Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the Chosen One Bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon the cross My sin Upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I Boast in Jesus Christ His death and resurrection Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my rent I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Well, good morning, church family. Welcome back to this Sunday. And today we're going to have a sermon that's not part of our old series, not the start of a new series, but rather it's a standalone series as we consider the communion table, the bread and the wine. And as ever, as we do that, we are reminded of the life, the death, the resurrection, and the coming again of Jesus. Of course, there's various angles that we can consider as we come to the table. And today we're going to be looking at the thought of gratitude and for that, we're going to be looking at an event that happened. It was recorded for us in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17 and verse 11. And it says this. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. <clears throat> As he was going into the village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. This is an interesting text which we will discover as we go through it and Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem and for this he's walking on the border between Samaria and Galilee and it's on this Samaria and Galilee border that Jesus encounters 10 men all of whom have leprosy 
Now, it might not be strictly leprosy as we know it today, but the word that is translated as leprosy could refer to any one of a number of kinds of skin diseases, but whichever, it did mean that they were cut off from society. They were ostracized. They couldn't participate in life. There was no family, no hugs, no worship, no work, no social standing. None of this was available to them. What would it have been like? And it can be difficult to imagine, but perhaps we can catch a glimpse of it. Imagine living in a level four lockdown, but there's no hope of it ever changing. This was going to be your lot in life. Or perhaps imagine you have COVID, the worst kind of COVID, and it just never gets better. People can never come near you. This was their everyday experience. We learned from the story that at least one of them was a Samaritan. Likely, there were some Jewish men in this group, and the context suggests that there is. The Samaritan is called a foreigner, and when he returns to worship uh, God and to thank Jesus, um, the, Jesus comments on the fact that the one that came to give thanks is a Samaritan. The implication being some of them weren't, most probably Jewish, as they were on the Galilee-Samaria border. Now, we know that the Jews and the Samaritans were not friendly towards one another. In fact, they were quite, there was quite an animosity which was expressed. And it wasn't only expressed from one side, but it was expressed from one side and it was reciprocated. The Samaritans uh, had intermarried over the years. And so they weren't um, shown or thought of, at least, to be um, pure in the sense of their lineage. They rejected Jerusalem as their temple. They, they, they re sorry, they rejected Jerusalem and they rejected the temple as the center of worship. But rather than that, they had Mount Gerizim where they had put up uh, um, their own temple. Earlier in this letter that has been written by Luke, um, Jesus uh, was rejected in a Samaritan village when they heard that he was heading on towards Jerusalem. And as a result of this rejection, James and John suggest that they should call down fire and brimstone from heaven in order to completely flatten this village. There wasn't even a, a hint of remorse in what they were saying. And even though we look at it now and it seems like an incredibly disproportionate response to a simple rejection. And yet for them, it, perhaps it gives us an insight, a window into how the Jews and the Samaritans thought of one another. So. We have this unlikely band of men who share something in common, even if it wasn't their lineage. They all have leprosy. They call out to Jesus and they call Jesus master. One dictionary defines that word a master as follows, a chief, a commander, an overseer, a master, that it was used by disciples in addressing the Lord in recognition of his authority. And this would be an interesting word choice both for the Samaritan and for the Jews that might have been present. And the reason why it's an interesting word choice is, why would a Samaritan call a Jew master? And why would Jews call a carpenter from Nazareth in Galilee a, a, a um, master? And the reality is they hope that this Jesus will do something for them. One commentator says that in Luke, when Jesus is referred to as master, it appears to have a specific connotation. He says this, Master denotes one who has authority consistent with miraculous power. And so these people are in need of a miracle, and I guess it would make sense to appeal to this miracle worker for help. They're placing themselves in subordination to Jesus, just as Peter did when he had fished all night and found nothing. And he says, Master, we've worked all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. Or on another occasion, when they were out in the boat, where the waves were pounding, they woke Jesus while the squall of fury raged. And they said this, Master, Master, we are going to drown. He got up, rebuked the winds and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Where is your faith? He asked his disciples. So these were people in need. And so they come to someone who they recognize as master. They recognize in Jesus that he is someone who can make a difference. And in this appeal to Jesus, they seem to acknowledge that through him, they are hoping that God will act mercifully towards them. They ask, and there is much that hangs on their request. Jesus says to them, go and show yourself to the priests. He doesn't command healing. He just, it just seems that as they went, healing occurred. 
He doesn't tell them what priest to go and see. Were they Jewish priests or were they Samaritan priests? Just simply go and show yourself to the priests. And the reason why, it wasn't because priests were involved in the healing process. They weren't. They weren't health practitioners at all. But they were, if you like, could be seen as the purity police. It was them that would have to give you the sign off to allow you to be reintegrated back into society. Once they gave you the thumbs up, you could work, you could socialize, you could worship, you could hug, you could do all the things that previously you couldn't do. But Jesus gives this instruction and they follow it. Now, I've been interest, interested recently at considering the miracles of Jesus and looking how people acted when he told them what to do. Now, when we look at the stories and we, that, 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 or the events that have been recorded for us in the pages of the New Testament, we often know the end of the story. We know how it's going to work out. We know a miracle is going to take place. But for the people who were involved, they didn't know. This was happening in real time for them. And so they were given this instruction, not knowing how it was going to work out. Jesus simply said, go to the priests. And they started off on their way. And their healing came in their obedient action. All they did was the simple act of obedience, and they should be commended for that. How hard can it be for us to move even in small steps of obedience? But for each one of us, we've got our next steps which are before us. And I don't know what it is for you. I don't know if you have not yet been baptized. And this morning at church, we have got a couple of baptism, baptisms happening at our 10 to 30 service. But, and perhaps it's you that is going to be the next one to be baptized. Perhaps it's to be engaged in a ministry. Perhaps it's to have a conversation you've been struggling with. Or perhaps it's to apply for a job you've been humming and hiring about. Or whatever it might be. But there is a faith element which is there. And we think perhaps it's going to be water that's just a little bit too deep for us. How on earth will we, will we manage? When Jesus told Peter to push out into the deep water to lower down the nets, we recognize it in deep water where we exact, the exact spot where we need God's help. It was when the storm raged that Jesus was in the presence of it and God acted through him. So I wonder what your next step is. I wonder what you can do to take that next step. As they go, they are healed. And it seems that the healing was obviously noted before they arrived at the priests, but one of them returned. Now, they all were very similar up to this point. They had the same disease. They were all determined to do something about it. They, um, they called Jesus master. They heard Jesus and hoped he would help. They all proceeded to the priest in faith. They were all healed, but one returned in gratitude. And the one that shows gratitude, remember, is properly dodgy. A Samaritan, dodgy heritage, dodgy worship center, dodgy theo theology. Everyone knows that about Samaritans, after all. One commentator writes that the word used as foreigner for this Samaritan that is used in this particular text was also used on a notice that was written in the temple precinct. And the notice read this. Let no man of another nation enter inside the barrier and the fence around the temple. Whoever is caught will have himself to blame that his death follows his death follows not a prosecution not a fire not demerit points not sort of a stand down period but death was going to follow if you were a foreigner and you dared to approach yet it was a samaritan who returns to jesus you see when it comes to these men we are not dissimilar to them we all have a problem or had a problem being unclean as it were sin does that no, none of us could stand in the presence of a holy God. Then there was no way of approaching. We all have sinned. After the miraculous catch of fish, the words of Peter to Jesus, recognizing him as God, he says, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Peter recognized that a holy God and a sinful person shouldn't be in the same scene together. But we know that Jesus didn't come to maintain a distance with God, but to bring God close to us like i say we were all in the same predicament as the as these men were unclean they call out from a distance and yet in jesus god draws near and he did the same for us he is a god who is a present god with us we all like them had issues that needed dealing with we were all unable to deal with them but jesus did so 
if we identify ourselves with these 10 lepers, which one of the lepers would you identify with? Are you in the group that head off never to return? Or are you more like the Samaritan who does return and with gratitude? You see, the 10 were willing to engage in a religious ceremony. And that religious ceremony can be an easy thing to do. Who knows? We might be simply engaging in a, in a religious ceremony even right now. But one returned. And when he returned, he did three things. He praised God. And why wouldn't he praise God? God had acted in his life in a very specific and a miraculous way. He falls at the feet of Jesus. And why wouldn't you fall at the feet of Jesus? He'd already acknowledged him as, as master. And so he comes in subordination to Jesus. And then he thanks God. He shows gratitude. This was such a big deal that Luke recorded it for us. And 2,000 years later, we are still talking about the gratitude of this man. How is it that we can show our gratitude to God? Not trying to earn anything, just recognizing who he is and what he has done. One of the things that we do in our home, and it's only a, a small thing that we do, but in order to carve out gratitude space on a Thursday night when Verena and I pray together, we use Thursday for thank you prayers. We th thank God for big things and small things. It really doesn't matter. It's just an opportunity for us to, um, to show our gratitude to him for what he has done for us. But what happens, uh, uh, sorry, sometimes it's easy to show gratitude where things are working well for us. It can be really difficult to show gratitude when it seems like everything is against us. Consider this. When Jesus came, uh, uh, consider this, the night before Jesus was crucified. Again, from the Gospel of Luke. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink it again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. With the cup and with the bread, Jesus gives thanks. Now, there is much discussion as to what he was uh, thankful for at this point. And, it could, uh, and there's a variety of things. It could simply be that he was using it like we might say grace. We give thanks for the food. Some read more into, the, into it because of the context and the words that he used. He gave thanks perhaps that now he was close to completing the will of God. That the day that his coming to this earth, the crescendo that had been building up, was almost upon him. Maybe he gave thanks because of what was going to happen and the lives that would be impacted as a result of it. Maybe he gave thanks because he looked down through history and he saw you and he saw me. And he gave thanks to God for us following him. Maybe it was all of the above or maybe it wasn't. But all we know is at this last supper, he gave thanks. On this, the eve of his death, and he knew it was the eve of his death, he chose to give thanks. Tomorrow, he was going to be in the hands of sinful men, and they were going to be doing terrible things to him. He would see tears shed for him. He would see the anguish of his own mother. Remember how Jesus responded when he saw all the sadness and the mourning that took place over the death of Lazarus, how Jesus himself wept. Tomorrow, he would see a number of people weeping over him. Who really understood that he was going to be raised from the dead? In the midst of all this darkness, he gave thanks. Even if it is at the one end of the spectrum, that it was simply saying grace, giving thanks for the bread and the wine. How amazing it is that in the midst of what was going to be a dark and troublesome night and the following day, he chose to give thanks. How easy is it for us to forget to give thanks, to recognize all that is wrong in this world, to blame God, maybe in the midst of that forgetting that in Jesus, God chose to draw near to us, that in Jesus, God wasn't distant, but very much present. One last thought to close. Of the men that were healed, one returned. It was the one who gave thanks that had an additional encounter with Jesus. He had a longer conversation with Jesus, spent more time in the presence of the Son of God. 
So it seems that giving thanks is a good thing to do. So as we consider the table, the bread and the wine, and what they symbolize, what they represent to us, the life, the death, the resurrection, and the coming again of Jesus, I wonder, what are things you would like to give thanks for? Let's pray. Father, as we come before you this morning, we recognize there is so much for us to be thankful for that you have provided for us. Each day is a new day, which is a gift from you to us. And we are thankful. We're thankful for all manner of things in our lives, from having somewhere to sleep, to having friends or family, to being able to engage with other people. But most of all, we thank you for Jesus and all that he means. And may our lives be a living statement of gratitude for the one who gave his life for us. We pray this in his name. Amen. Thank you.